You ever just want to quit your job, buy a boat, sail around the world? Well, what if we told you that was possible? I'm Rad. And I'm Sasha. With more willpower than money and a dream to become pirates, we bought a sinking sailboat and spent the next nine months transforming it into one of the sexiest boats on the seven seas. There is nothing that can get in the way of us sailing around the world. So grab your popcorn, hit subscribe, and be prepared for one hell of a story. The story of our lives. This is the journey of Spirit Animal. <laughs> we just got a massive package from Battleborn and our boat is now a floating mecca of power. Over the last seven months, we've been surviving off these two very old AGM batteries that can barely charge a cell phone at night, and this 2000 watt generator, which has allowed us to run all of our power tools and transform this sinking can of worms into our beautiful, dreamlike floating home. However, aesthetics aren't everything. A boat is only as comfortable off-grid as its electrical system allows. And after putting this much love and affection into the layout, it's only right that we install a battery system that the boat deserves. So we reached out to Battleborn and they answered our prayers. Sasha and I came from two separate boats that were severely underpowered. We were waking up to battery alarms three times every night, and I remember spending at least 10 hours a week inside the generator compartment trying to get it to run. So on this boat, our main goal is to run completely off the sun. Yeah, we're talking enough solar to recharge our batteries for multiple cloudy days, to run our water maker, our air fryer, our water heater, and eventually an AC system. Enough solar that we're never gonna need a generator. And that's exactly what we did. I know it looks professional, but we were just like the majority of you when we started. On to the drawing board. We got a battery. <laughs> <laughs> Screw it. It was an absolute nightmare, but who wants to watch a video of Sasha and I pulling wires, scratching our heads, drawing countless diagrams, and listening to a bunch of videos made by electrical horn dogs that can't even relate to the average person who knows nothing about electricity. No, the point of this video is to give all you Gilligans out there some basic knowledge of marine electrical systems so that you can look at your boat and actually understand what the hell is going on. No, we're not certified marine electricians, but look at us now. Now when I fart, lightning comes out of my ass, so I feel like I'm credible enough to give you guys a few pointers. But after all the hours of research, here's what we came up with. You get it? Didn't think so. Simplify it, bro. Your boat runs off a battery bank, which is considered to be low voltage. Now there's items on your boat that drain your batteries, like your radio, your refrigerator, your chart plotter, and your lights and there's other items that charge your battery bank, like your solar panels, wind generators, and your alternator. Now regardless if they use power or charge power back into your bank, they all attach to the negative and the positive terminal on your battery bank. Now with all these crazy connections, it's only a matter of time until there's some sort of short or lightning strikes and you have an excess amount of electricity in your system. Well, this electricity needs to escape so we can protect our system, so we attach a negative wire from our battery bank to the largest piece of metal that touches the water. And on our boat, that's the engine block. So all the excess stray electricity will run through the engine block, down the prop shaft, and disperse into the water. And it's extremely important that all the items on your boat share this common ground. Now I know all this looks hectic, but if you look at each circuit individually, they all look like this. A wire comes off your positive terminal and connects to your item, and then another wire connects it back to the negative terminal, completing a full circle. Now a fuse is added to protect the circuit, and a switch is added to turn the item on and off. And that's the basics of your low voltage electrical system on your boat. However, there's also high voltage items that we like to run off our boat, such as our air conditioner, hot water heater, and our water maker. 
they run off the same high voltage that comes from the power lines that go to your house. Well, what's the difference between high voltage and low voltage? Where's the line drawn? Well, it's just two different forms of how us humans have figured out how to create electricity. You've heard of the band ACDC, one of the most iconic rock bands of all time. Well, their name means high voltage, low voltage, and they got that name from looking at the back of their sister's sewing machine and seeing the term ACDC and thought it resembled their raw energy and power driven performances. And here's the difference between the two. In high voltage, the electrons move through the wire in an alternating current. And in low voltage, the electrons move through the wire in a direct current. But the only thing you need to take from this is that AC means high voltage and DC means low voltage. So how do we power high voltage items off of our low voltage battery bank? Well, the most common way is to crank up your noisy generator that burns fuel to produce high voltage to power these items. However, we're here to tell you that these days it's possible to avoid having a generator on your boat. The introduction of highly efficient solar panels and lithium ion batteries have made this, well, a game changer. Explain it, bro. Well, first off, we want to thank Battleborn Batteries for sponsoring this video. And before you guys say, oh, well, this is a biased review, we are here to tell you that after countless hours of research, looking through teardown videos, reading customer reviews, forums, all that, we reached out to them. And when we got the email that they wanted to partner with us, we were ecstatic. But we would have chosen their batteries regardless. And after going through the install and dealing with the company, their customer service is the best we've ever seen. So now let's tell you why lithium is a game changer. Up front, most people are blinded by the price tag. I can get a lead acid battery for like 50 bucks out of a used golf cart. But did you know that per kilowatt of energy, a battle born battery is four to six times cheaper than a lead acid. They are a fifth of the weight for equal usable power and two to three times the power in the same physical space. They charge faster, they have internal battery management systems to protect them from shorts and overheating, and they have 100% depth of discharge, where lead acid only has about 50% of usable energy. And not to mention, Battleborn has an industry-leading 10-year warranty. So when you guys decide to upgrade to lithium, you can use our affiliates link in the description, which will get you $50 off per battery. What size should my bank be? Well, we don't know how much power you use, bro. So what we have to do is add up our daily power consumption. And to do that, you have to add up your watts. The watts are the total amount of electricity an item uses per hour. So now we have to make a list of all the items that we're gonna run off of our battery bank. And since we're not gonna install a generator, for us, that's everything. All right, our air fryer says it uses 1500 watts per hour and we're only gonna use that for 30 minutes a day. So on average, that'll use 750 watts of electricity per day. The water heater says it uses 900 watts per hour, but we'll probably use that for about 20 minutes a day to heat up the water before we shower. That means it's gonna use 300 watts in 20 minutes. You're gonna go through every item on your boat so that you can get a daily average. However, not all items tell you the watts. Some items only tell you the volts and the amps, like this bilge pump, for instance. You can see here, it says 12 volts, 4.8 amps. But to figure out how many watts it uses, all you do is multiply the volts times the amps, which gives you the watts. But to truly understand this equation, you really need to know what volts and amps are. So let's start with volts. What are those? Electricity can come in different forms. It can come in the form of a lightning bolt, or as a tiny static shock on your favorite slide at the park. Us humans have learned how to harness and use this energy in multiple different forms, and those are what we call voltages. Electricity is like alcohol, and these drinks are like the different voltages. What form of alcohol are you drinking tonight? You gotta remember, your boat's battery bank is low voltage, and the power lines that run to your house are high voltage. And the common forms of voltage that we use on our boat are 12, 24, 36, and 48 volts. And the common types of high voltages we use at our house are 120 and 240 volts. All of these drinks are just alcohol, and all of your voltages are just electricity. So what form are you using it in? Amps! 
So now regardless of whatever voltage an item is using, it needs to use a certain amount of that voltage to run properly. And that is called amperage. So imagine we're at your mom's house and your mom knows we're scared of the dark. So she takes a little bitty nightlight and plugs it into the same socket that her big ass refrigerator is plugged into. Those things are running off the same high voltage, but there's no way that little bitty nightlight uses the same amount of power as that big refrigerator. And you're right, that little bitty nightlight might only use half an amp of that 120 volts to run per hour, whereas that big refrigerator is amped up and it might need 10 amps of that 120 volts per hour. It's kind of like alcohol. Pretend Sasha and I are two 12 volt appliances that run off of the 12 volt battery in your boat. Now see, even though we both run off of 12 volts, I need a lesser amount to run properly. <sighs> Woo, that's amperage. So if we have high voltage items using a certain amount of amps and low voltage items using a certain amount of amps, how do we compare the two to see which one's using more electricity in general? Well, full circle here, you take the volts, times the amps, and you get the watts. The total amount of electricity an item uses per hour. Back to the chalkboard. Okay, we calculated our air fryer and water heater. Let's look at the refrigerator. On the back it says 12 volts, four amps. Put that into the equation, and that means it uses 48 watts of electricity per hour. We know this thing is gonna run for 24 hours a day, so 48 watts times 24 hours means it's gonna use 1,152 watts of electricity per day. So now you have your average number of watts you use per day, and with that number, you can decide on which size battery bank you need. A good rule of thumb is to take that number and multiply it by three or four. That way you have a minimum of three or four days of usable power because not all days are sunny and you might have to go a week without recharging your batteries. Now we plan to power a lot of items. So after calculating all the amount of watts we're gonna use in one day, we got around 4,200. That gives us 12,600 watts of power that Sasha and I are gonna use in three days. The thing is, batteries come in amp hours. So we have to convert our watts into amp hours. And if volts times amps equals watts, well then watts divided by volts equals amps. So since we're doing a 12 volt battery bank, we take 12,600, divide it by 12, and that gives us 1,050 amp hours. So we went with 5, 8 the 270 amp hour battle born lithium batteries. Follow me, we have to mount the batteries. So, this is the back, right, left, what is this? The port. The port cabin. Port, port aft, cabin. aft cabin, as you nerds would call it. Basically, we're gonna turn this into a battery solar controller powerhouse. Cut these two out, put them against this wall, and it's kind of simple. It's never as simple as it seems. Cut out the shelves so that we could double up the back wall so that heat won't transfer over to the other bedroom. Then we had to engineer some cradles so that the batteries fit nice and snug. Okay, muscle woman. Who ready does? I'm ready for muscle woman. Here she comes. The, the woman that does all the heavy lifting. Look at those guns. Squeeze my booty through the doorway. That booty barely fits through the doorway. Okay. 100 pounds. Now we gotta get it down there. I'll leave that to the muscle mans. Well, the muscle mans might pull a damn gooch in this position. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah. I'm also gonna put a stopper here so this battery can't move forward and backwards. After that, we had to make a door to cover the battery compartment. And just like the back wall, we doubled up the plywood so that heat wouldn't transfer into this bedroom. We routed the edges, covered it with veneer, and it blended right in. Yep. Yep, yep. Yep. Tight squeeze in there. Tight squeeze right there, boy. Okay, 
Look at that, this thing's dry and level. That is where the first battery sits. Nice and cradled in there. Oh yeah, woo, that's pretty. Look at that, it's tight. have our batteries in look at that thank you Sasha behind the scenes for helping me with that but this is a super tight spot and uh, everything's really tightly calculated I'm super happy we got all four batteries in actually all five batteries in the fifth one is right down there you can see the terminals so next up we are going to start mounting the Lynx distributor and all the solar controllers and everything on this wall right above it for a neat and clean install strong man <laughs> all right let's go Planning where everything goes took a long time, but the neater everything is, the easier it is to wire. We began with the big 4 aught cables since that's how we'd connect everything to the bus bar. We started cutting, crimping, and heat shrinking wires, making sure to only use tin copper wire and tin copper lugs. We began bolting the wires to the bus bar starting with the negative side. From this point on, it's very important to not let your wrench cross the negative and the positive terminals or else you're going to see a big spark. So we set our fuses down and started connecting our positive wires. And now this bus bar is powered up. Overall the install went slow and steady. It was tough with the big wires because they didn't twist very well. However, we knew this was going to be the case, so we actually crimped all the lugs on in the exact location so the wires didn't have to twist once we hooked them up. We also installed some computer fans in this compartment because we knew that this area would probably heat up, and the cooler everything is, the more efficient it'll run. The bottom fan pulls in cool air from the back transom area, and the top fan blows out the hot air. And then we connected them to a little temperature sensor that tells them to turn on when it gets to 100 degrees. Once we got around to the smaller wires, everything began to move a lot faster, although it was tougher to keep everything organized. You really want to treat this like a piece of art, because the cleaner the install is, the easier it is to diagnose any problems in the future. And plus, we knew this was going to take us three or four days to do, so at the end of the day, we wanted to be proud of our work. In the beginning, when we were looking at the diagram, everything was very confusing. But as soon as we started and began installing one wire at a time, it all began to clear up. As we moved along, we began double checking every wire size as well as every fuse size to make sure that we didn't miss anything. Once we got the little wires all buttoned up and neat, it was time to move on to the inverter. Now it turns out there wasn't any room in that compartment, but we found a little cubby hole five feet away and mounted it on its side inside this little cubby hole. We made sure and put plenty of ventilation ports in this cubby hole because the inverter can get pretty hot when it's under a heavy load. Inverter is on. Look, wiring in our cabinet is done. Look at this, this is all of the mayhem we've been doing we did this from scratch so we walked you through the simplified diagram of how a boat works well now let's walk you through the diagram that Sasha and I drew up all your batteries connect to a bus bar which harnesses the entire power of your battery bank but we're using a glorified bus bar called a Lynx distribution system this is basically a big bus bar it looks confusing it's really not confusing this is a, the ground bus bar the positive bus bar okay so they're all grounded under here they have a 300 amp fuse on them this has a terminal fuse so it's a little different now we move over here so this is the Lynx 1000 shunt. This is basically the divider between your battery bank and everything that uses your battery bank. All this shunt does is keep track of the power that's going out or in of your battery bank. Now it's extremely important to use the exact same length of wire to attach all your batteries to this bus bar. That's about as close as you can get it. 
If you don't, then some of your batteries will do most of the work and in turn won't last as long. Now for safety, we're gonna ground our negative bus bar to our engine block, which is the common ground that every item will share. Okay, now we're ready to start attaching systems to the right side of the bus bar, starting with our AC and DC panel. Our positive wire goes through a battery switch so we can turn it on and off, and our negative wire feeds back to the negative bus bar. Now this supplied DC power to the right side of our distribution panel, but the left side is high power, which gets its supplied power from an inverter. Now we installed a 5,000 watt inverter, which is so powerful that it required us to run two positive and negative wires to it. The positive lines run through a switch so we can turn it on and off, and the negative wires run through these two metal devices called CSL 500s that are basically like a soft start for the inverter. All they do is pre-charge the capacitors inside of the inverter so it doesn't get damaged when you send power to the unit. Battleborn recommends installing these on inverters that are at least 4,000 watts or larger. But anyways, now that our inverter has DC power, it spits out AC power, and we feed that AC power to the left side of our distribution panel. And since this inverter is also a charger, we connect it to our shore power so that when we plug in our shore power, it'll recharge our battery bank. And speaking of charging, the next thing we're gonna connect is our solar panels. These will tie into a dual pole switch so that we can turn them on and off if we need to. From there, they feed into our MPPT solar controllers, which takes the electricity that the solar panels make and spits it out at the correct voltage for our batteries to charge at. We also put fuses in line in case there's ever a short, and they tie directly into our bus bar to charge our bank. Now this other battery switch is tied directly to our starter battery, which is designed to crank the engine. This is completely separate from our house bank besides the common ground. We wire the positive side to the battery switch and then to the starter on our engine, and it recharges from the alternator on our engine. However, that alternator can produce a lot of power, and this battery is pretty much full all the time. So we have a DC to DC charger which is smart enough to know that when the starter battery is fully charged it takes the excess power and dumps it into our house bank. And since we have three battery switches we plan to run the last one to an outside panel to control our electronics. And the last thing we did is install this Servo GX which is basically the brains of the operation. It tells us exactly how much power every item is using or putting back into the bank and it'll send the information right to the GX50 touchscreen that'll be mounted at our nav station. Now that we got the heart of the boat beating, we are one step closer to having a boat that's capable of going around the world, which is kind of pathetic for us to say since Vikings did it with an ax, a moon rock, and a crow, but who's to say they wouldn't have jumped on the comfort train as well? And plus, we gotta document our adventures so we can share our story with you guys. But for now, we're going to sit here in awe and admire this beautiful system that we just created. It's only a matter of time till our hot water heats up, and it's been a long time since we've had a hot shower. We want to give a huge thank you to all of our patrons. We really, really cannot do it without you guys. And as always, we want to give a special thank you to all of our upper tier patrons who get a plaque on the spirit animal. And if patron isn't your thing, we also would really appreciate it if you would like, share, and subscribe to our channel. We do read all of your comments and they mean so much to us. They are really motivating. If you want to help support the channel in any other ways, we do have some sick merch that you can go on our website and check out. And we're doing cameos. So if you have a crush on someone and you're too scared to ask them out, or you have someone in your family and you want us to wish them a happy birthday, we can do that for you. Anyways, thank you so much guys and we will see See you next week.